Hi everyone and welcome to the Retro Shack. And if you've seen our BBC Micro series, then you'll know just how prolific that machine was in schools in the UK throughout the 1980s. There's a link on the screen somewhere if you want to pop off and watch that first. The reason for the BBC being in almost every school is that Acorn Computers won a government tender to choose a microcomputer to support the computer literacy project. This project ran throughout the 1980s and aimed to provide a generation with the skills and opportunities needed to allow Britain to be successful in what was seen as an upcoming microcomputer revolution. The leading competition for the tender came from Sinclair, who at that time was synonymous with innovation and very much in the public eye. And Clive Sinclair was surprised not to have won with his newly released ZX Spectrum. In the context of what the BBC wanted, however, it's easy to see why the Acorn machine came out on top. Of course, that wasn't the end of the ZX Spectrum, which went on to dominate the UK home microcomputer market, being under half the price of the BBC Micro. Most parents, when faced with spending almost £400 to replicate at home what their children were using at school, instead opted for the Spectrum at £175 for the 48K model. This domination of the home market caused Acorn to quickly draw up plans for a Spectrum killer to rip the rug out from under Sinclair's shoes. Taking the BBC Micro as a base concept, the designers were tasked with building down to a price rather than up to a feature set. They wanted all the cool bits of the BBC Micro that would appeal to the home market and that outperformed the Spectrum, and were happy to lose features that they felt were more of interest to education, scientific or corporate use. So Acorn had a plan for a machine that was technically superior to the Spectrum, at a price point that was very comparable and a rock solid reputation. Christmas was looming and the machine had been advertised heavily for months beforehand. Their assault on the home micro market was assured. So why didn't it work? Let's find out. The machine that Acorn launched was called the Electron, a name in keeping with their original Atom and the Proton, the name for the BBC Micro whilst it was in development. And it certainly looked and felt like an absolute cert. And at a planned £150, it was all set to take the world by storm. But before we get to the problems on the horizon, let's take a good look at the machine in the flesh. The Electron was solidly built and easy on the eye. Size-wise, it sat somewhere between the Spectrum and the C64 and was much smaller than its bigger brother, seen here in her newly refurbished glory. I'll just pack the old girl away and keep her looking good as new, and the link to the refurb is on the screen if you want to pop off and watch that. The Electron and the original Spectrum were a world apart in terms of look and feel. The Electron keyboard is exceptionally nice to use, easily a match for the BBC Micro, and knocks the socks off the Spectrum's dead flesh keyboard as it came to be known. The Electron did take a design cue from the Spectrum in the form of shortcuts to the most common basic commands, being able to type by pressing the function or funk key, but you could also type the commands in full, which you couldn't do on the Sinclair machine, at least until later versions emerged. Connectivity wise, the machine is much less capable than the Beeb and mainly consists of video connectors, three in total, being RF, composite and RGB. And there's a cassette interface too, but you do need an adapter to use an ordinary cassette player. On the bottom, there's a single edge connector protruding from the mainboard, and this allowed connection of the plus one interface, which gave the machine two ROM cartridge slots, an analog interface for input devices, and a Centronics parallel port to attach a printer, all for just £59.90. Although at this point, you were in BBC Model A territory. On the other side, there's the power input and that's your lot for connections. Okay, so far we have a nice looking, well-made machine with a lovely keyboard and small enough and cheap enough to impress. Let's take a look on the inside and see what's going on in there. Access to the Electron is gained by removing the case screws on the underneath of the machine in these four locations. So let's quickly whip those screws out.
We'll gently lift up the upper case containing the keyboard and then carefully remove the ribbon cable connector from the mainboard, allowing us to lift the top case clear of the bottom. And looking inside, we can see that the mainboard is really compact, with the right hand quarter of the case being taken up with power circuitry. When we compare this board to that of the BBC Micro, it's clear to see the difference in overall complexity between the two machines. And the key reason for this was the advanced ULA, or Uncommitted Logic Array, which served to combine multiple integrated circuits into one combined unit, thus reducing the cost and increasing the efficiency. The CPU is a 6502A, running at 2 MHz when accessing ROM and 1 MHz when accessing RAM, and we'll come back to why this is important later. The ROM contains the Base OS, BBC Basic version 2, and also the Advanced Disk Filing System, an improved version of the disk filing system found in the Model B. And at the front, we can see the four 8K RAM chips, making up the machine's 32K memory. And all of this in one hand span of a mainboard. Very impressive. Let's finish our roundup of the internals. Here's our RF modulator, our RGB output, the cassette port, and lastly, our composite output. You really could connect this to any display. Power comes in here, and here's where our edge connector exits the machine. Finally, there's a built-in speaker, and in the tradition of the BBC Micro, there's no volume control. And that's it. Apart from these mysterious, unpopulated sockets here at IC17 and 18, these sockets were left over from when the machine was going to have two 16K ROMs. Instead, the machine shipped with a single 32K ROM, and these sockets were removed from later revisions. And there's none of your flimsy membranes on this keyboard. Everything here is rock solid and built to last with mechanical switches, a nice thick PCB for the keyboard matrix, and a pretty sturdy connection cable to boot. Just look at all that shiny copper. So there we have this lovely little machine, well made and cleverly engineered. So I guess it's time we talked about the electron in the room. There were three main reasons for the relative failure of the electron. And to be fair here, failure is a subjective term. The machine sold almost a quarter of a million units over its lifetime, but that was compared to lifetime sales of 1.5 million BBC Micros, 5 million ZX Spectrums and a whopping estimated 12.5 to 17 million Commodore 64s. The first reason revolves around issues in manufacture and manufacturing cost. Acorn employed Ferranti to create the ULA for the Electron, as Sinclair had done for the Spectrum and the ZX81 and that enabled Acorn to reduce the chip count from 100 plus in the Model B to around 12 to 14 chips for the Electron, depending on the revision. By the time the machine was ready to sell, costs had increased substantially and the original £150 price point had to increase to £199 in order to make the machine viable. The second reason was that during that almost year of delay, sorting out those manufacturing issues, the Spectrum itself had seen its price reduced to just £99 for the 16K model and £129 for the 48K, a price point Acorn could no longer match and they were back to being almost twice the price of the competition. Thirdly, compromises in the design in order to keep costs as low as possible had led to high levels of incompatibility with BBC Micro software, to the point where software that did load on the Electron ran significantly slower and many titles had to be rewritten specifically for the machine. The main reason for this was that the 6502A chip running at 2 MHz when accessing ROM only ran at 1 MHz when accessing RAM due to display overheads and limitations in the ULA. This caused many programs written for the BBC Micro to run at under half their original speed on the Electron. The ULA itself was an advanced piece of hardware and difficult to manufacture. Estimates are that up to 90% of ULAs delivered to Acorn were faulty and just plain didn't work. This inevitably led to delays in getting machines to stores in time for the crucial Christmas period, and nearly 270,000 units delivered to Acorn from the manufacturers after Christmas sat on shelves unwanted, as buyers had turned to the Spectrum or Commodore 64 instead. 
after the video game crash of 1983 and the following microcomputer market crash in the UK in 84, Olivetti bought a significant interest in Acorn and the Electron could be found for as low as £99 in some retailers. After this, the machine enjoyed a brief swan song and was even noted as the best-selling micro in the UK for a short period of time. Acorn, of course, went on to much greater things with the development of their risk processors, but that's a subject for a different series in the future. I do hope you've enjoyed our introduction to this wonderful little machine. Please join us in part two of the series when we'll be doing a full refurbishment and also looking at some of the peripherals available today that make the machine a real delight to own. If you enjoy our content, please like the video, subscribe to the channel and press the bell to receive notifications of new content. Did you have an electron? Let me know in the comments section and until next time in the shack, it's goodbye for now.